All right, guys, let's go ahead and finish these notes out. Um, this is a two-part packet, remember? Um, and so you're going to get to the Unit 10 Urbanization, and we're going to start from the very beginning of this unit, if you will. Two units in one. Urban America, we're going to date this 1865, which, as you know, is the end of the Civil War to 1896. And we refer to this time as, and we've already talked about this, the Gilded Age. Meaning gilded, what? Gilded means covered in gold. But not necessarily the best underneath. Now, I just want you to kind of watch this part. Um, just going to have a couple questions over it. And so I'll see what you can um, inference from this. But immigrants from Europe during the Industrial Revolution gil Gilded Age are going to spike like crazy. You know that. The labor force is going to be um, entirely basically made of immigrants. Now, this is showing from 1870 to 1920. You'll notice that it really starts spiking around 1880, especially right here and Western, um, Western Europe. Southern and Eastern Europe progressively goes up as well and really jumps around the 1900s. That's the one that really takes up. So with that, you have to kind of keep in mind that during the Gilded Age, you're going to have dips in immigration, but then increased spikes. Then you're going to have more dips and then a huge spike, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and then you'll notice they all die off about the same time. Now, the question I might have on a quiz is what happened in 1914? And if you listened, you'll know it's World War I. Now, with that, you also have another way of looking at immigration over that time period. Um, that was a line graph. This is another form of chart you may see. Um, the bigger the bubble, the more the immigrants. Obviously, main immigrant source is going to be Germany. Absolutely. Irish, um, a lot of English, um, actually significant amount of Russian and Austria-Hungarian, um, maybe even Italian as well. So I want you to realize that there's tons of different ways that I can show you um, what the immigration looks like. And you need to be ready for all of these. Um, immigrants, foreign-born children, um, mixed parentage by, by um, county. This is showing you that the darker it is, the more immigrants. Obviously, you have in the northeast, the darker it is. Interesting thing is, is up here in Minnesota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, you have a lot of purple, which is more than 75% foreign-born or um, family-oriented. Um, a lot of them are going to be in New York area as well because, of course, you know the port and what we're going to talk about is going to be Ellis Island, as is San Francisco over here. Now, this is the very first slide, and I'm going to be very honest with you. This image will stick with you as soon as you get it. Pause it, get it down. All right, so what you're looking at is possibly one of the most, in my opinion, striking political cartoons because it shows the double standard that is immigration in the United States. Obviously, unless you're Native American, you're an immigrant. Um, political leanings aside, every single person here is an immigrant. But the question is, are you an old immigrant or a new immigrant? New immigrants are fresh off the boat, like this gentleman right here with the hat, pots and pans, everything he owns on his back. The old immigrants have assimilated... What did I just say? Assimilated. They're wealthy. They eat well. They've got fur and they're good to go. And they're telling the new immigrants, no, we don't like you. There's a term for this. You need to make sure you know what it is. A fear of immigration is nativism. If you said that, kudos to you. But when you look at this longer, you'll realize that the new immigrant, the old immigrants, but what doesn't match? The shadows of the old immigrants that have been assimilated because at one point they were or their grandfather or great grandfathers were new immigrants as well meaning they're having a double standard now these double standards pause get down are because many American nativists dislike the new immigrants because they a refuse to assimilate um, B, they would segregate into ethnic neighborhoods, or you know the other one and you can write it out to the side if you need to but why do I really fear immigration 
a fear of taking jobs. Um, and back then, when you're talking about an industrial factory um, economy, this is actually a, a, a verifiable fear. Um, because I can hire an Afri um, uh, immigrant, I'm sorry, brain fart there, um, for a lot less um, than what a white assimilated American would be hired for. And they don't care what kind of working conditions they are in. They got on the ship. They got off the ship. They need a job. So they aren't going to be as whiny. And I don't want a lunch break or I want a lunch break, that kind of stuff. So you got to kind of remember that you've got immigration um, as a source of easy, cheap labor that doesn't complain or really unionize. Um, here's another really good image. Take a look at this one. Might ask you about it. United States of America, it says, admit it's free, walk in, welcome. Obviously, Uncle Sam doesn't match the sign. And here, interesting thing, look at those two luggage pieces that my immigrant has. Poverty, disease. I also like how on his backpack it says anarchy. Interesting. Now, this is a good EOC question, shows you what could possibly come up over immigration. And this has nothing, these slides have nothing to do with Cuba um, or Florida foreign born. But if you take a look at this, I want you to see that you actually can figure out the answer if you even haven't studied it. If you know that Florida and Cuba are close to each other. Just kind of sharing that with you. The more we get into EOC stuff, the more I'm going to share with you and how to decipher questions. Now, this is interesting here, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Pause it, get it down. All right, so we are going to study immigration from start to finish in American history. And with Chinese exclusion, um, you can hear Colin. Um, <laughs> with Chinese exclusion, it's exactly what it's saying. Um, Chinese Exclusion Act. We're going to exclude the Chinese from all immigration. Um, this is actually the first law ever in American history to restrict immigration. Before this, there was always an open door policy for immigrants. No formal anything. You come, we welcome. Um, the Chinese exclusion is the first ever thing to stop this um, from a specific group. This is also kind of an interesting um, San Francisco uh, newspaper. It's called the Illustrated Wasp. And a good quiz question might be, what does WASP stand for? Well, WASP are white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And obviously, that's going to be your nativists. Okay. Now, the Chinese Exclusion Act was by President Hayes. Um, you might want to take notes to get this down. Uh, he vetoed this act. No, I'm sorry, it wasn't by President Hayes. It was um, vetoed by President Hayes. And this would be the reason he was not elected. Um, Chinese immigration would be outlawed until the 1920s due to the Chinese Exclusion Act. I've always found this was very ironic because we brought them over here to build what? The railroad. And then we all of a sudden are like, oh, no, never mind. So I've always thought this was a very um, hip a critical moment for American history. Um, I like this illustrated wasp um, uh, cover because if you look in the background, you have right here Hayes and the Republican Party, and he's shooting himself, kind of graphic, um, but he's shooting himself with anti-Chinese, um, and then it literally says revolution, and you'll notice how is the revolution characterized in a white robe? Hmm, with a hood. Here's another really good, interesting um, cartoon. We might look at this one um, in class, but Miss Columbia there embodies the United States. Now, any immigrant that came through would come through Ellis Island. Pause it, get it down. This, in 1892, is the first immigration center. You can still visit it today. It's actually a museum. Totally one of my life goals to go there. I've been to New York three times and every single time I have missed this. The last time was after Hurricane Sandy and it was closed because it had no electricity. Totally mad. But I'm going to New York. You can come with me if you want. But the goal of these um, screening centers, there was going to be Ellis Island in um, New York City and actually, interestingly enough, Angel Island was on the West Coast out um, next to Los Angeles. 
because um, that was where a lot of the Asian immigrants, even though Chinese immigrants will be excluded, you'll have Asian immigrants coming. The idea here is you need to screen the immigrants. Um, physical examinations, where they comb through their beards, what were they looking for, you think? Hmm, lice. Um, they would get off the boat, they would go through all of this, they would stand in long lines, and all of these people were doing it because there was golden opportunity in the United States. There was the ability to take and to make something of yourself, to go from the shadows of an old immigrant with nothing, or a new immigrant with nothing, and go to these old immigrants with wealth and status, this rags to riches. Kind of an interesting um, uh, EOC released question as well. See if you can figure out the answer to that. Now, the Gilded Age overall is going to be um, a phrase that Mark Twain kind of coined, if you will. He said, it's the best and worst of America. It suggests that there's this glittering layer of prosperity, but it's covering up a lot of corruption. And that corruption and that bad, that, those bad things are going to be what needs reform. So the corruption, let's talk about Mr. William Boss Tweed real quick. Pause it, get it down. All right, make sure you're ready to listen to this because this one's an important one and I'm going to go quick. William Boss Tweed is possibly going to be the biggest, corrupt, most horrifying individual in all of American politics. Yes, even worse than our current candidates, okay? But with that, he is going to be the mayor of New York City. Um, uh, he is going to be in charge of all city jobs, business licenses, influencing courts, all this stuff. And literally all of these politicians, William Boss Tweed being the example we're using, um, bosses will be paid by the businesses. They they will be getting voter loyalty by sometimes handing out money saying, hey, don't forget election day next Tuesday. Um, but with this, this election fraud, and sometimes we'll use the word grafting, make sure you get that down, down here, okay? Um, is a political influence or personal gain used in a negative way. Machines take kickbacks. So what this guy would do is he'd be a corrupt politician and he'd be like, hey, I'll take and I'll give you the the job to build the courthouse if you'll slip me $100,000 in my next campaign. Well, I'll give you the job. You make millions of dollars. You give me money. I'm happy. But then the taxpayer suffers because you're probably going to charge a little bit more. Now, Boss Tweed, again, like I said, New York City, he is going to form what we will refer to as Tammany Hall or the Tweed Ring. Let's pause this, get it down. Um, he will be elected to city council, and in 1852, he serves in Congress. But with this Tweed Ring or this political machine, he is going to buy votes, encourage corruption, and control all of New York City's politics. Later, he'll be arrested and jailed in New York City. Um, he will die in jail. But one thing that I always thought was very interesting is how he's, he got the um, support of the slums. Now, this cartoon is a Thomas Nast. Good question for the quiz, maybe. A Thomas Nast cartoon. You might want to write this outside him. And in all of the cartoons, they show William Boss Tweed being overweight, gluttonous, shady, and overall just a really a, a bad individual. Okay? So that's what you're looking at when you look at corruption. Uh, this is a released EOC question out beside um, uh, political bosses. You might want to make sure you understand also that during the 19th century, one way political bosses gained support was by campaigning for women's suffrage. No. Advocating the use of poll tax. No. Making improvements to the urban infrastructure in slums. Yes. Um, actually, what these political bosses would do, would they would go into the slums and they'd be like, hey, um, you guys really need, uh, running water. And of course the slums are like, uh, yes, of course we do. Um, and so he'll be like, I will take care of that if you will go vote for me. Or he might walk up to somebody and be like, hey, um, you know what? You look like you could use a couple bucks. My name's William Boss Tweed. I want you to go vote on election day. Of course, who are they voting for? Um, so this corruption will, of course, be underneath all of the glitz and glamour of the Gilded Age. So that's the end of part one. Stay tuned.